This past Sunday, um, I segued back to Christmas time for the homily. Uh, Christmas in July. <laughs> and uh, I talked about the three comings of Christ, that he, he, uh, he came to us in history. Um, he comes to us today in mystery. And he will come again in glory soon to judge the living and the dead. Now, uh, stay with me as best you can. He came to us in history. As we're sitting here at this moment, it's been uh, 2,024 years uh, since the birth of the baby Jesus in Bethlehem of Judea. And um, so you can visualize the wise men of the East looking into the crib and the wise men of the West, the Greeks, will show up at his death. But when you're looking at this baby, uh, you're looking at God. Now, he said, where are you going with this? When, when, when Jesus is in his 30s, uh, Philip said to Jesus, uh, show us the Father, show us God. And Jesus said to him, Philip, how long do I have to be with you? Whoever sees me, sees the Father. Whoever sees Jesus, sees the Father. Now look into the crib. See the baby. Whoever sees Jesus, the baby, sees the Father. And where the Father is, there also is the Holy Spirit. So it's an incredible mystery that the eternal triune God has taken flesh. So he came to us in history, and we crucified him, as you know. But even there, uh, by dying on the cross, he destroyed our death. By rising from the dead, he has promised the resurrection of all of us on the last day. And we look for him to come again in glory soon. So he came to us in history. He comes to us in mystery. Mystery is a kind of a Greek word. It's kind of like the Latin word sacrament. Um, like, you're a bit of a mystery, and so am I. Like, you're a spirit uh, living in a body, and the body is the sacrament of your soul. So he comes to us in mystery. Um, the most obvious one, I suppose, that we deal with every single day for 2,000 years is that on the night that he was betrayed, and handed over to be crucified, that he took bread, uh, gave the bread to his apostles, saying to them, take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. He was giving us himself to us under the form of bread. And then, of course, the last part, he will come again in glory soon. Now, you might say, you have a lot of nerves saying that he's, come to get, he's going to come again in glory soon. Well, the very uh, last few verses of the book of Revelation, um, don't go away. Here it is. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to make these revelations to you. The revelations that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. I've made these revelations to you for the sake of the churches. I am of David's line, born of the house of David, the root of David, and the bright star of the morning. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, the church, you and I, say, come. Let everyone who listens answer, come. Then let all who are thirsty, all who want it, may have the water of life and have it free. And in the last verse, the one who guarantees these revelations repeats his promise, I shall indeed be with you soon. Jesus said it, I'll be with you soon. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. A thousand years in the mind of God is but a day. We're only in the third millennium, the third day since the dying and rising of Jesus. Okay, back to my subject. Chapter 8 of Mark's Gospel. Again, Mark's Gospel is like a two-act play. 
The first eight chapters are about a man named Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, um, who goes about opening the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, uh, raising the dead to life. And we're in chapter eight, and it's the second miracle of the loans. Now, once again, a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat. So he called his disciples to him and said to them, I feel sorry for these people, for they have been with me for three days now and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way. Some have come a great distance. His, his disciples replied, where could anyone get bread to feed these people in a deserted place like this? He said to them, how many loaves have you? Seven, they said. Then he instructed the crowd to sit down on the ground <clears throat> and they took the seven loaves and after giving thanks, he broke them and handed them to his disciples to distribute. And they distributed them among the crowd. They had a few small fish as well, and over these he said a blessing and ordered them to be distributed also. They ate as much as they wanted, and they collected seven basketfuls of the scraps left over. Now there had been about 4,000 people. He sent them away and immediately getting into the boat with his disciples, went off to the region of Dalmanutha. Uh, this is the second miracle of loaves in Mark's Gospel. And let me bring you back. Your fathers at the time of Moses eat the bread in the wilderness, but died nonetheless. So these people looking at Jesus who performed um, twice now, huge crowds of people in the desert area uh, were probably saying to himself, this is Moses. He's the prophet that was promised in the Old Testament, like Moses. And, but there's more, and we, we touched that later on, on the night that Jesus died, he took some bread again. So the new Moses. Um, the Pharisees came up and started a discussion with him. They demanded of him a sign from heaven to test him. And with a sign that came straight from his heart, he said, Why does this generation demand a sign? I tell you solemnly, no sign will be given this generation. And leaving them again and re-embarked, he went away to the opposite side. So he, he uh, with the Pharisees who, who were enemies of him, his enemies, and they were trying to destroy him. Uh, they're looking for a sign again. But he's been giving them signs all along. Uh, he opened the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, the tongues of the mute. He cast out devils. He raised the dead to life. Um, he he uh, forgave sins. And they want, they want a sign. So in this case, he says, Goodbye, goodbye. Um, there's another time when he's asked for a sign. Um, they say, give us a sign. And he said to them, it's, it's an evil and perverse generation that asks for a sign, he said. The only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah has spent three days in the belly of the big fish, so the Son of Man will spend three days in the belly of the earth and after three days rise again. A veil hangs over the eyes of the Jewish people when they read the Old Testament. And this is an example of it here. Uh, they, they have the story of Jonah, which is a marvelous story, a marvelous story. Jonah spending three days in the belly of the big fish and being spit out again. And Jesus is letting them know the story of Jonah is about me. I will spend three days in the belly of the earth and after three days rise again. I don't know why a veil hung over the eyes of the Pharisees that they couldn't see who he was. But then again, 
the apostles didn't see who he was either. They just thought he was a teacher come from God. Moving along, um, the disciples had forgotten to take any food and they had one loaf with them in the boat. Then he gave them this warning, keep your eyes open, be on your guard against the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Here we go again. Um, they said to one another, is it because we have no bread? Now again, in context, be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, the yeast of Herod. Be like, it'd be like um, Jesus saying to you, be, be on guard against the yeast of O'Doherty the priest. Um, is it because we have no bread? And Jesus knew it and he said to them, why are you talking about having no bread? Now this is fascinating to me. He's going to ask them seven questions in a row without waiting for an answer much. And shortly after this, you're going to see where they realize who Jesus is for the first time. Jesus knew it and he said to them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you not yet understand? First question, have you no perception? Are your minds closed? Have you eyes that do not see, ears that do not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves among the 5,000 and the, how many baskets full of scraps did you collect? They answered 12. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full of scraps did you collect? And they answered seven. And he said to them, are you still without perception? Have you no idea who I am? And they didn't. Now something is going to happen now where all of a sudden Peter will realize for the first time. They came to Bethsaida and some people brought to him a blind man whom they begged him to touch. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. Then putting spittle on his eyes and laying his hands on them, he said, can you see anything? The man who was beginning to see, and the apostles are beginning to see, uh, replied, I can see people. They look like trees to me, but they are walking about. Then he laid his hands on the man's eyes, and he saw clearly he was cured. He could see everything plainly and distinctly. And Jesus sent him home saying, do not even go into the village. Now watch Peter, for the first time he will get his sight. Jesus and his disciples left for the villages round Caesarea Philippi. On the way he put this question to his disciples, who do people say that I am? Now the answer is already in the question, listen to it. Who do you people say that I am? Remember Moses when he said to God, what is your name? He said, I am, is my name. Who do people say I am? And they told him, some people say John the Baptist, they said. Others, Elijah, who went up to heaven in the fiery chariot. Others say that you're one of the prophets of old. But you, he asked them, who do you say I am? Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ. Finally the Christ, the eternal Son of the eternal Father. And he gave them strict orders not to tell anyone about him. Now you might wonder at this stage, why did he say don't tell anybody? Well, <laughs> they probably had a wrong idea of what the Messiah was. He'd be somebody who would come and throw out the Romans and uh, liberate the Jews. But uh, this Messiah is going to liberate the whole world. Anyway, the, the blind man at Jericho, his eyes are opened up. He can see. And finally, Peter can see the Christ. Okay. Now, there's going to be a change here, incredible change. The miracles will start disappearing. There'll be some, but they'll start disappearing. And 
he has a whole new focus now that the apostles know who he is. Listen to it. Um, and he began to teach them, began to teach them that the Son of Man, namely himself, was destined to suffer grievously, to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be put to death, and after three days rise again. And he said all this quite openly. Then taking him aside, Peter started to remonstrate with him, to argue with him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, because the way you think is not God's way, but man's way. So Jesus has set his face, now that the apostles know who he is, he has set his face towards Jerusalem, towards the crucifixion. And you hear Peter uh, protesting, you know, you'll never be crucified. And he said, get behind me, Satan. I find it interesting that, <laughs> that Jesus called the first pope Satan. We leave that part rest there. Zeffirelli, who was a filmmaker in the 60s and 70s, did a life of Christ. He was a communist and not a believer. But he does a marvelous job with this part here. He shows you in his movie, Jesus is striding, striding towards Jerusalem. And the apostles are way back, way back. They're, they're, uh, cause they're, they're frightened and scared and everything else. And, and uh, Jesus goes back to them several times to bring them forward. You know, come, come, because it has to happen. And then he gives us a teaching for the whole world. He called the people and his disciples to him. If anyone wishes to be a follower of mine. So raise your hand if you do. I can't see you. Do you wish to be a follower of mine? Listen to what we have to do. Let him renounce himself. Let her renounce herself. Let him renounce himself. Take up his cross and follow me. He said, go against yourself. Renounce yourself. Take up your cross, whatever your cross is. Part of your cross might be having to listen to me today. For anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. But anyone who loses his life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. What again then is it for a man to win, to, to win the whole world and lose his soul? You could be a multi-billionaire. How good is that to you if you lose your soul? And indeed, what can a man offer in exchange for his life? For if anyone in this adulterous and sinful generation is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man, who is Jesus, will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father and with his holy angels. So now they know who he is, Jesus. And uh, as I said, the miracles would disappear. And the emphasis is now uh, the Son of Man must be crucified so that he can destroy our death and by rising restore our lives so that we can live forever. Amen, 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 amen.